You guys serve in the military at all? No. No. Uh, unfortunately not mate <laughs> look down on us <laughs> no not at all you obviously fucking dodged it well done yeah it was a consideration growing up because there weren't a lot of other opportunities uh, no it's good there are more opportunities now to yeah be fair. absolutely yeah. I, I had asthma so I, I could yeah, I tried yeah, to yeah. I tried to enroll when I was like 19 Did you? yeah but they, I had asthma from like two years old so oh. they were like fuck off basically <laughs> <laughs> good right let's do it Guys, is that uh, a hairdryer and a mirror? It is, mate. Do you need it? For you guys. <laughs> Fuck me, mate. <laughs> what has happened to the modern man? How old are you? Hey, by the way, oh, that's 41. not mine. That's not How mine. old are you? 34. What is all that about? Ask him. We have a we have a wide range of guests. <laughs> oh, it's occasionally please. windy, it's mate. It's not for guests. It's, it's, for it's, you. it's a video podcast. What are you <laughs> oh do? man, come on then, let's go. Jeez, I love that. Oh fuck. my god, Give me a stick already. All right, welcome back to the Everyday Perspective podcast. Please like the video and subscribe to our channel. Today's guest is a local MP, Johnny Mercer. Johnny, how are you? All right. Yeah. 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 Good. Thanks. Gotten over the the, the hair dryer. Uh, Shock. Well, I thought I thought this was a podcast. So it didn't really matter what you look like, anyway. But it's a video podcast, mate. It's a video po- it video podcast, it right? Is. Okay, okay. For those of you who can't see, there's there's basically a, a hairdressing salon in the corner with <laughs> um, a hair dryer, hair product, three combs. Three and I combs. thought, <laughs> I thought, I thought, um, yeah, like it's a bit like a ladies' dressing room, isn't yeah, it? It's just but professional, mate. That's just all, for yeah. you guys, apparently, which is nice. Yeah. Pause. Well done, modern man, right? Thanks, mate. Pause. That's it. No, no worries. <laughs> so, mate, we're going to get into a little bit about politics. Oh, um, dear. Before we do that, though, I've got to ask the pressing question because yeah. you were obviously on Channel 4's Banged Up reality show and you got the pleasure of sharing a cell with a convicted hitman, Kevin yeah. Lane. Yeah. And there was a, a hilarious scene between you two where he was very kind to offer you a cigarette, which um, in, in some way you appreciate, but not in others. Yeah. But we've got to ask, how, how was that show and, and how was it sharing that cell with that man? so i mean i'll be honest the show was the show was pretty tough uh it's probably one of the hardest things i've done what happened was i i've um you know my career is kind of up and down right and uh uh one of the prime ministers liz trust sacked me um i've been sacked a couple of times and i basically thought you know politics wasn't wasn't to be anymore and was looking at doing other stuff and started looking into tv and um basically did a pilot to do some immersive journalism to get into prison I did the pilot and then obviously we had a new prime minister who asked me to come back into his cabinet. So I then had to stop it and they then turned it into that show. So it, the genesis of it wasn't wasn't that show. But I was in there um, on my own at a different time to everyone else. And yeah, I mean, it was challenging, right? I think uh, prison is, um, you know, clearly a quite a dehumanizing place. Um, you're mixed in with um, some pretty interesting people. And that was certainly the case for me. But the what it doesn't convey right is the sort of lack of control you have when they lock that door and and you're not going anywhere um and you know i only had it for a few days but um um it's pretty unpleasant obviously pretty intimidating as well mm, yeah i bet so so just so we understand then so it, it was relatively realistic in the sense you were actually locked in the cell oh yeah i mean it's po- probably the most realistic um thing you can do without actually going to prison um because all these guys are sort of three months out of out of jail Mm. Um, you know they are um, you know it says on the program they're reformed I I think (laughs) that's that's doing a bit of heavy lifting Um, but uh, yeah locked door you can't get out Um, yeah I think it's safer now I think if they get another series it'll be safer and slightly different but (laughs) certainly I was was the first guinea pig in and had a chat with them about safety afterwards definitely yeah yeah and yeah and how did you find Kevin Lane because he's a I've seen him on other podcasts actually I don't know if you're familiar oh, with no, him no I don't I don't know who he is is he a nutter he's an interesting guy yeah <laughs> he spent a very long time in prison for, for killing people um, so that tells you something well he would claim he's innocent was he convicted for it he was convicted okay uh, yeah I mean interesting guy so it's kind of the first guy I feel um, really decent guy um I mean, obviously, he did murder someone, so there, there is that. But, um, you know, he, he's, in my view now, you know, prison for, for people like him works, right? I mean, there's all this narrative that prison doesn't work and all that. So actually, for people like him, it did because it changed his life around. You know, I can't see him reoffending. Um, and, you know, I've seen him a couple of times since. We had lunch in the House of Commons and I've set him up with a job and things like that. So, you know, there's that really positive side of it. And then, unfortunately, Kevin, I think, has been recorded 
called back to prison in the last couple of weeks. Has he, um, he has, yeah. So, um, you know, so, so you get, but you get all sorts of characters um, in prison um, from across society, loads of different stories. Um, and it's a fascinating kind of petri dish of blokes why why blokes do what they do why why do some cross the line why do some become violent um the emotions at play and all sorts of things mm -hmm. yeah and you kind of uh you kind of joked about or you commented about it reforming them or them being reformed but you know questionably do you think prison works in its current setup oh you could say you know there's there's uh a view where it does work and you look at people like Ophel, the first guy I saw and actually you know victims have, have a right to expect people to be locked away I think yeah, you know and victims often get forget forgotten in a yeah. lot of this but yeah there's real issues around reoffending, you know and the repeat revolving door um, particularly around minor crimes and minor sentences um, but any conversation you have around that in this country is immediately drowned out by those who just want to send more and more pr people to prison right so um, I think you've got to be careful about it you've got to follow the evidence um, but I think yeah in some cases it works and in some cases it doesn't it's not it's not black and white no, of course not. And what was the reaction like following the show? Because I know for me, I mentioned a second ago that I, I found the whole scene hilarious, but actually found it, it kind of drew me into you a little bit because Danny had mentioned previously about getting you on being a local MP. And I was like, nah, don't want to speak to a politician, they're boring. Yeah. And then I saw that show, particularly that yeah. scene with the window. And thankfully, I haven't got any windows in the studio, so we're safe. But, okay. <laughs> but like, fair play. But yeah. You obviously were very real in that in that show and very yeah. authentic. Yeah. Um, what's the reaction been like? With, certainly with your colleagues in the in Parliament to that show. Look, I, I don't think I don't think the reaction of my colleagues in Parliament is, is a particularly sort of strong barometer as to how how <laughs> people <laughs> not. actually feel. Right? I mean, it was the most downloaded um, episode one of a series they've ever had on Channel Four. Was it? Uh, yeah, the they did really yeah. well. Yeah, they did really well. Um, and what was the reaction? I mean, yeah, but yeah, really positive. Obviously, politics is is just is kind of it's it's not real, right? It's fucking like mental, isn't it? It's a um, it's a kind of pantomime. So obviously, when you're representing eighty thousand people in Plymouth and you've got to make a decision about something, clearly people are going to get annoyed when you make decisions they don't like. And so there's people who get up in the city every day to try and sort of. Um, knock me out of public life and their their reaction was predictable but they were kind of on their own in that respect everyone else you know thought it was it, it was really good and um, yeah I'll be honest I mean it, it was it was a, a hard program I found it pretty difficult and it was pretty uncomfortable yeah and I imagine some of the inmates probably pressed you quite hard about various topics as well yeah of course they do of course they do and you've got to I think always in public life you've got to be you've got to be careful what you're doing you know, you've just you just got to be careful. You've just got to think about what you're doing, um, think about your job um, and what you're there to represent um, and, and behave accordingly. Yeah, no, fair enough, mate. But yeah, well done. It was a good show. Good to see you on there. And tell us about your background because um, you've not always been in politics. No. So where'd you grow up? So I grew up in Sussex, um, but uh, I essentially joined up, came down here and joined up when I was a teenager. So came down to Plymouth, um, joined up a 2-9 commando in the Citadel. And um, I mean, you know, I've, I've never really been one with like a huge ambition to be a soldier or to be, you know, to be anything really. Um, but I joined the military, I think, for reasons lots of people join the military to play a bit of sport and have a good time and, you know, be with like-minded individuals, fit, strong, all the rest of it. Um, but then uh, obviously 9-11 happened when I was going through training and that changed what being the military meant to, you know, a whole generation of us. And we ended up, you know, I personally ended up in, in Afghanistan um, 2006, 8, 9, uh, 10. Um, and that very much sort of shapes me. I think, you know, people, you've had Mark Onward on the program, I think, mm -hmm. and, you know, very much shaped uh, our characters and our um, our personalities. I never thought that that would then springboard me into this, right? I never thought that I had this campaigning sort of gene on it. I just, I was just faced with this um, real, from you know, I thought it was, it was an appalling um, contrast between the way people spoke about veterans in the UK and then what it actually felt like to be a veteran, what it felt like to be bereaved by service, what it felt like to lose your arm and legs like Mark has done. Um, 
and the contrast between that and obviously what politicians like to say and how the country likes to parade its war heroes, right? So, so I just thought I'm going to try and change it. Um, I mean, there was a particular moment. I, I came back, I was taking commando training in 2012 and um, there's a program by Panorama that year that looked at um, suicide in the serving and veteran population. And actually in 2012, more took their own lives than were killed in the conflict that year. And there were a couple of really heartbreaking stories in there of guys who did that. Um, uh, one in particular, Lance Sergeant Dan Collins, um, who basically had um, fought in Afghanistan around about the same time as me, um, came back and he really, really tried hard to get help. He really went for it, you know, everywhere he looked. And in the end, um, he just couldn't do it anymore. And he went up to Sydney Bridge and he made a video for his mum. He was like, look, I'm so sorry, but there was just nothing here and I can't get away from this, you know. And it was awful and he, he killed himself. And I just remember watching that thinking, this, this country's got to change. And I, I, I never... You know, I don't have, the, I, I never had this kind of messiah complex that was going to be me. I was just determined to change it and determined to kind of make people feel uncomfortable until until we got there. So th that's why I, I decided to go into it. But I'd never, never voted before, never had anything to do with politics. Um, you know, you have to join a party if you're going to get elected in this country. I obviously um, joined the Conservative Party. Um, and in Plymouth, that's obviously quite a rough ride. Um, traditionally a, a pretty strong Labour city. Um, but uh, I thought, yeah, like you guys, really, I thought, why do people not vote? And most of the time it's because they're just not engaged. They're not engaged by people. People don't go out and make the effort to bring them in. Uh, my wife didn't vote and all the rest of it. So basically in, in twenty end of 2014, I drew up a map of Plymouth, a uh, street view map, and I basically marked up every single house and worked out how many houses I could bang on in a single day. <laughs> I was literally going door to door like that. And then worked back from the general election and worked out that um, if we started on the 2nd of January in 2015, I'd get around every house in Plymouth and Moorview. Obviously, not everyone's going to be in, right? But at least you've gone out there, you've made the effort. And I thought, if you do that enough, you know, people will see how much you care and what you believe in. They'll actually think, yeah, it's worth going out in the general election and voting for this guy. Um, I just made that calculation off the, off the back of my head, really. I didn't, I, there was no science behind it. Um, I did it with my wife, who is um, a lot better than me. Like, I think most people think they're voting for her. Um, and uh, yeah, we got round and it was amazing. And I, I won and uh, never really looked back. I went and gave my maiden speech about veterans and spoke about Dan Collins and a few others and guys who I fought with and died. And um and then I, I, I became, you know, so it wasn't the ambition to go into that and create this this furrow, right? But I just kind of fell into it because then people wanted to know, like, what do we need to change around veterans? The trouble is there's a big gap between people knowing what they want to change and the kind of intellectual changing of policy to change what it feels like to be a veteran. So, you know, I had to take Veterans Affairs out of the Ministry of Defence because these are not serving personnel. They're civilians who just need civil society to work for them. Um, and I had to build in, you know, all sorts of pathways around health, housing, education, mental health provision, um, jobs and all the rest of it. And slowly it's been a long time. You know, I've been sacked twice from this job. I'm back in for a third time. But, um, you know, this prime minister wants to make this the best country in the world to be a veteran. And it's a privilege to try and deliver that. Mm. Yeah, so quite a, quite an amazing story, mate. And to be fair, I didn't realise that you were in a similar position before you jumped into politics yourself, where you weren't even voting. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I had the traditional view of politicians um, after the expense scandal that I think any right-minded um, person would have uh, that this was a different world, um, that uh, um, almost uh, had nothing in common with. But I always saw, I did see politics as this powerful platform because when I was in the military, I would, particularly when I was doing sensitive work, politicians would, would get involved and you brief them on what you were doing. And I just remember looking at them, you know, David Cameron and Gordon Brown and others and just looking at them and thinking, if I had your position, I would go on about this injustice every day until it changed. And that's really where the thought came from because I thought, yeah, you know, that's that's what I'm going to get this platform, then I'm just going to use it and use it. You get, you know, you get two two types of politicians, basically. You get people who go into it because they want to be someone. And you get people who go into it because they want to do something. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, there's loads of the former. Um, but if you want to do something, it's an amazing 
platform. You know, if you look at one facet of veterans mental health, right? I set up something called Up Courage in 2019. Uh, it's a 24 million pound uh, pathway through the NHS specifically for mental health care provision for veterans, the UK's first mental health care provision for veterans. 19,000 referrals in its first year, right? Where are all these people going before? So, and I just wouldn't have, you know, I'm I'm, a, I'm obviously a bit down about politics and some people love it and I, I just don't, I'm afraid. But, um, you don't get that platform anywhere else. I wouldn't. I wouldn't be able to do that. I wouldn't be able to change these lives. I would. You know, there were no rough sleepers, uh, veteran rough sleepers this Christmas because of a lack of provision because we designed a pathway for them. So, and I just wouldn't be able to do that outside politics. So, I'm. I'm kind of a bit of a. You know, I'm. I'm con I, you know, I'm constantly in contrast. Really, I, I. The whole games of politics is just horrific. But then you you have this platform to do amazing stuff for people who need you. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Quite refreshing to hear, isn't it? Yeah, it must be so so weird being one side of it and then seeing the other side. Yeah, do you know what? It's kind of it's kind of worse. So so I had a pretty dim view of it when I went into it, and actually, like when you're in it and you look behind the curtain, like it, it, in my view, it's worse. It's actually yeah. See, this is why again I, I don't vote because I just don't have any faith in it. Yeah, but you have to look at you have to. Yeah, I think, you know, we have a two-party system in this country. We have a first-past-the-post system. And I think, you know, there's people who are not fans of that. So in Europe, they have smaller parties and you have coalitions. And what coalitions do, so you have lots of different parties come in to a, um, you know, form a government and they kind of take the edges off different policies and they end up hopefully pretty centrist. Um, you know, that's certainly the case in the coalition government in 2010 where you had Lib Dems and, and uh, the to Tory party. Um, but, you know, I was listening to a really interesting uh, interview uh, recently from uh, the president of France, who's just, who stepped down before Macron. And he was like, he, he, he wanted to change the kind of two party state, but now they have, you know, they, they, they've kind of changed that a little bit in France and they've got, um, you know, and, and there's coalitions and all the rest of it. But he actually regrets that now because every kind of presidential runoff comes down to one guy or girl and then the far right or the far left or some sort of extremist. And it's always going to be that one person. So it's kind of taken away that competition. So, you know, Churchill said democracy is the best of a, of a very bad set of choices when it comes to running a, cho running a country, <laughs> right? So, and I think he was probably right. I just feel like my vote doesn't really make a difference yeah. that's my honest that's my honest opinion it's not like you know I'm, I'm not into it you know i don't really mind but i yeah. always feel that you're just voting in one fucking person who's going to do the same thing as the other person effectively yeah it's full of lies yeah. they say that you know brexit was a big thing yeah you know we're going to save 300 million for the nhs or this sort of stuff then they that when it's all done, oh, you know, apology. Yeah, we didn't, we couldn't, yeah. we couldn't provide that. It was, it was false information. Blah 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 blah. We just put that on fucking buses. Yeah, you know what I mean. And then what, from from just a regular person viewing that, you're like, I ain't got time to to even look into it to how real it is or not. Yeah, or look, whatever. I get it, I get it. And it's just it, that's what I mean. But for you, where you've been a military man wanting to change something, and you're changing it for 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 what you believe in, it must be just crazy to see the other side. The Boris Johnson stood there, who's like fed into this pathway where they're always going to be politicians or they're always going to be this certain way. And then you're seeing the, that side of it. it must be pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. It's an amazing position to be able to have that view. It's, it's, it's a real privilege, but I would, all I would say as well, and you know, Boris is a good case in point is that generally the public perception to the private perception is, 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 is completely, completely different. different. Do you know what I mean? So these characters are built up. Like even I'm built up in the media in certain ways. Right. Um, and they're, they're just completely different from, um, sort of getting to know them. I don't think, you know, I don't think a, a few people really go into it. I think to do bad. I think that, um, being in politics, if you're quite sort of weak and shallow, um, you know, suddenly the newspapers will want to hear what you have to say and you get loads of attention and all this. I think that changes people very, very quickly. And I've, I've seen that change people very quickly. I can imagine. The pressure must be horrendous. The pressure must yeah, be horrendous. Yeah, it's really disappointing because I particularly like, some of my biggest run-ins in Westminster have been with 
people who've served in the military as well. No Cause, way. Yeah, because they go up there and they're absolutely committed to supporting the party, supporting the government. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm obviously there. I'm a, I'm in the Conservative Party. I'm part of the government, and I'm there. But ultimately, I'm not there for myself. I'm there for, you know, foreign and Commonwealth veterans who need their visa fees waived. I'm here for people like Mark Onward. I'm here for lads and girls who live in Plymouth and need better services. So um, for me, it's always it's always been this kind of tension. You know, I was go running around trying to get visas, um, visa-free settlements. So basically, if you're a foreign and Commonwealth soldier, you're a Fijian or whatever in the military and you leave, you used to have to pay to stay in the country, which is just insane, right? Sometimes it was over £10,000. So guys would send their wife and kids back and then work over here trying to bring their families over. These guys being the military toys. I was going around trying to get these, with Dan Jarvis, a Labour MP, trying to get these guys visa um, free access to the UK. And other military conservative ministers were campaigning against me. <laughs> and it just kind of like, it just kind of blows your mind. It is mad, isn't it? But I think people always have to have an agenda, whether they feel that strongly or not about it. They sometimes take dislike to people rather than, policies and that's what annoys me a little bit as well with politics you talk about boris johnson people boris done a lot of good and a lot of bad and whatever people have his opinion but i don't think it ultimately with everything he went out to do a bad thing yeah, of course you know but, but people no matter what good he would do yeah they would always because they didn't like him as a person they would always come back to oh, no, i've done this wrong right. but you he's done a thousand things all right time. and it's always the one wrong the thing. media the whole time right once they've made their mind up, everything that that person does is good or everything they do is bad. And nobody's like that, right? Yeah. I've made loads and loads of mistakes in this, right? So people can't, you know, nobody is all good or all bad in that respect in terms of their career and the policies they've made. And you're absolutely right. And I think po podcasts and things like this is how the media can't control this anymore because you can come up yeah. on here and we can have an open, open and honest conversation about something. Yeah. Whereas if you were doing an interview with the media, you're very guarded. Yeah. Even... I used to own a shop at the bottom end of town. Yeah. And I remember when I was about 19, I'd done an interview for the, I don't know, West Country News or something. Yeah. And I said loads of nice things. And I said, yeah, but the market's, you know, it is struggling, but it's getting better, blah, blah, blah. They cut out everything in between and then to cut me just saying that the market's struggling. Yeah. And I got fucking shit so, from so it, from, the, from exactly the market. And like, I was like, then? you know, I was naive, you know, I said, you know, five minute interview, they cut out 30 seconds. And I was like, holy shit. Like the, uh, people like you, must, it must be horrendous. Mate, so it happens all the time. It happens, and it's so frustrating. This is why you have to keep at it, right? Because, you know, because I'm in public life, I have to keep engaging with the media mm, like course, that. Yeah. And I'll be honest with you, like, I don't like it. I don't I don't like engaging with yeah. uh, the media. I did when I was back, a backbencher and I was campaigning because I used them to help campaign to achieve a department an office for veterans affairs to change the law on northern ireland veterans and all this stuff so in that respect they were helpful but they're not your friends right no, they're yeah. a business and it's important to remember that and it's incredibly frustrating if you're trying to because nothing's black and white right no, you try and put out a nuanced message and they'll take one bit of it and then in my opinion and my experience completely misrepresent your views yeah and again that's on one person's interpretation of that conversation you know that that person might be quite left or right or whatever exactly and, and you could they can take one specific part and then just make it that's why i think that, that podcast and i don't know even social media is it's got a lot of bad but it's got a lot of good you know yeah. you can get uncensored information you know we can get the, this full interview out on youtube yeah people can make their own yeah, minds yeah they yeah. can watch it for what it is rather than they'll still probably someone, cut part of it <laughs> yeah they can still trim yeah. something but at least people can at least people can go back and find the full conversation yeah though. the full information if, if they if they want to where again if it's an interview on on the fucking news account yeah. yeah so i guess I, i'd like you to try and help us navigate this whole situation which situation of understanding where to kind of put a vote yeah so we've just explained how how the media will have an agenda yeah. and how people will form opinions based on individuals and whether yeah. they like them or not as like a, a layman, yeah, I'm thinking, right, I want to use my vote. Yeah. But I, I, A, don't know where to start. B, don't trust anyone. I can't trust the media. Like, where, where do I even go to begin to know who to vote for? I think you've got to really look at the individuals who are standing and really try and work them out, right? Because Is locally or nationally? Locally yeah. and nationally, right. right? So locally, whichever party they're standing for, 
it's far more about their character and their values and what they truly believe in mm -hmm. than in some ways than, than the party, right? Because if you look at, you know, I'm, I'm not going to talk about anyone else, but if you if you look at myself, for example, I've clearly got a set of values and, and so on that I, I try and live and, and, and work by to the point where I've been pretty unpopular in, in my own party a number of times. I've, I've been sacked, as we've talked about. Um, but that's because I feel I have a duty to Plymouth and a duty to veterans above everything else, including um, my party. Um, if you look at the way others go about, the way they'll talk is that their party gets everything right all the time and they've got the answers to everything. Mm -hmm. And to me, as a layman voter, that would make me very nervous because no party has got the right answer to everything. And the way two-party politics works is that if a one party does one thing, it's a good thing, the other party has to criticise it, right? So you're not, you know, and provide that. So it's mad. I know, it's always like that. So it's have a look like at that. the individual and the sort of values and character that that individual does a, a lives a lot of life by. When it comes to the national picture, it's the same. You're essentially at a general election choosing who you want to be prime minister. That's essentially what you're doing. And really look at the character uh, and the values of, of the two main party leaders and think which one is really, which one uh, aligns with me and is really going to have my and my family's best interests at heart. Um, and uh, that's the choice you need to make. Yeah. And where, where's the best resource to, to, to explore those values and those things? Because again, it, it's known where to look as well. Well, yeah, I think, I think you have to do it over time. So th this is quite interesting, right? If you go on, you see on side, see unseen side of politics. If you're on Wikipedia, right? I always get annoyed if I go and do a speech to someone and uh, do a bit of fundraising and all they do is read out my Wikipedia page because there are activists in Plymouth, right, who get up every day to try and make me lose my job. And that is from everything, from editing my Wikipedia page <laughs> to make it look like I'm the most crooked bloke going who has time to do this shit but they do this <sighs> is their life crazy. Right? because they're so obsessed every day you you just you put on um social media <laughs> put in my name you'll see some of the appalling stuff on there every single day um because it's everything to them it's it's you know being in power and their political party is everything to them um so where are you going to look i think you've just got to make your own mind up over time do your own research just be really you know, really kind of savvy as to where you're getting your news from. I mean, look at, you know, the Plymouth Herald will have a view, you know, generally pretty left wing, the Daily Mail, generally pretty right wing. Um, you know, the podcasts are good, but to be honest, a lot of the podcasts, you know, you look at uh, the um, politics one that Alistair Campbell does. I mean, he's very left wing. But that's it though. That's, a, that's an agenda, isn't it? They are. That's, they're that's, agenda that's driven. Like the but you have to be able to kind of find your own yeah, path. Yeah, of course. Yeah, everyone has a, a, a and way. And that's, why, that's why politics is quite interesting as well because obviously in the media and everything else, this country's gunning for change at the next election. They're like, everything's rubbish. We're gunning for change, including the papers and everyone else. When I knock on doors, it's totally different. It's totally different. If you speak to people like, you know, how are you? What is going on in your life? What's working for you? What's not working for you? The narrative on the doors is totally different to the media at the moment. And that's why I think this election will be quite interesting. So what are you hearing on the doorsteps then? What are people saying? Um, look, I mean, some people, uh, for some people in our city, um, you know, through no fault of their own, life is really bloody difficult. Okay. And that's because... The government for them is massive. They're in social housing. Their child may have special educational needs. Um, and, uh, you know, the local authority won't be helping them particularly uh, and things like that. For them, it's really, really tough. Uh, I've got to be honest, the, the majority um, is pretty good. People like living in Plymouth. Uh, the economy, local economy in Plymouth, when it comes to jobs, is in a good space. When it comes to uh, median wage, we're in a good space. If you look at, you know, why do you live in a certain area? Schooling in 2010, 42% of kids in Plymouth Moorview were in good or outstanding schools. It's now 84%, right? So, in, if you're going to transform the life chance of kids who grow up in Plymouth, that's where I decided to put my energy and that's where we've seen real results. Obviously, people want to live in different parts of the country for different reasons. I want Plymouth to be the best place to uh, live, work and raise a family. And, and so I try and tackle those sort of key metrics and we've been successful in that. Have we got everything right? Of course we haven't. You know, and there's always more we can do. 
I think the only thing that affects like me from where I am is just mortgage, mortgage rates. Mortgage rates, Personally, yeah. That's like yeah, me so and my friends. Yeah, so a period of real inflation, right? Yeah. Um, and it was scheduled to go on for a lot longer. I mean, but by quarter two of this year so in a few months time um inflation back down to two percent or below two percent come but down what? yeah come down from 14 percent um you know when this prime minister came to office it's pretty impressive yeah i i, I, I quite like uh rishi sunak i think he's uh i like it that he's just quiet i don't hear too much about him it was pissing me off there and boris in the news oh, every two seconds right. and like every day. i think he must be doing a good job because they can't slate him enough that's what i always think if he's quiet he must be doing all right you can get like saturated with news, can't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. If well, if they do something wrong, they're all over it, like you said. So if he's if he's not in the news for the wrong reasons, he's obviously doing something. He's right. a really smart guy. He's really capable. I know him very well. Um, he's uh, he he's um, a good leader. He is uh, empathetic. You know, the the media character again is just like. Yeah, because people, you know, I get charactered in the media, you know, for all sorts of things, being sick because I was in the army and all this stuff. <laughs> you know, it's just ridiculous. And I, you know, that's by people who I look at and I think, wow, you really are thicker than a whale omelette. And you're telling me <laughs> that I'm thick, you know. So it's just, and, and it's like that, but a hundred times for the prime minister. Oh, yeah. He always get it from everywhere, all over yeah. the world, not just a country. Yeah, hundred percent. You, you we kind of touched on a few bits there. Obviously, cost of living's been a big sort of factor recently. Yeah. Um, we've already touched on the sort of men's mental health. So, obviously, you're very passionate about that, and and also, well, specifically around sort of military guys. But I think for men under fifty, suicide is the biggest killer now. Yep. Um, so it's obviously a real problem. And obviously, the NHS feels like it's on fire at the moment as well. Um, so they're the things I think that we're probably seeing as the everyday person. Yeah. I mean, you talked about there's maybe a need for change. I mean, what do you think needs to change in this country? I still think there's a, there's a, there's a lack of sort of fundamental honesty in, in the debate. So I think this idea that everything's perfect in this country is obviously not true, but this idea that everything is broken and we're all fucked is obviously not true either. You go up to Derriford today with an emergency, you'll get world-class treatment. Um, you know, you, um, we don't, you know, we have uh, levels of sleeping rough in Plymouth, but we generally have a good provision when it comes to the hostels and things like that. Um, you know, our kids, 84% of kids in good or outstanding schools, um, you know, our emergency services, our security, you know, if you look at what's going on in Ukraine and other areas and Gaza at the moment, our security is is fantastic. We live free lives. We have a free press. Um, you know, our, our politics, you know, people would say they're corrupt, but actually the people who actually look into it realise, you know, we're one of the most open and transparent democracies in the world. So this idea that we're all, you know, that it's all terrible is rubbish. That said, you know, could, can we be doing better? Of course we could, you know, and, and, and the pandemics, 400 billion pounds they spent on that pandemic, 400 billion pounds. I mean, it's just mind blowing. Um, so of course I would prefer to, you know, the economy to be doing better. Um, I'd prefer mortgage rates to be lower. I'd prefer to build more houses so people can get on the housing ladder. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, better jobs and skills and opportunities for people in Plymouth. But that's why I stay in the job because I want to keep going on that, right? And I want to transform life chances for kids growing up on estates in North Prospect and St. Buda and, um, uh, and across Plymouth. So there's more to do, but I think you can't have an honest conversation um, with, with anybody who thinks Plymouth, you know, has done anything other than, you know, is in real danger of fulfilling its potentials as, as the best place in the UK to live, work and raise a family. I mean, it's completely changed over the last 10 years, um, but we've got further to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 100%. With the NHS thing, I mean, I agree, the NHS is amazing and the, the yeah. healthcare we, we get, certainly from, you know, an emergency department is amazing. Obviously, the waiting list in the, in the emergency department are obviously quite long and I know the hospital itself is often at that yeah. point of of bursting at the seams. Yeah. So there definitely feels like there's some work to do there. And I think, again, just sat here as a, as a normal bloke, think it just feels like we're so far away from that ever improving. Yeah. The NHS is a really fascinating one, right? Because ultimately you have this healthcare that's free at the point of need in the UK, right? It's set up in 1948. Um, and since then, obviously the population has changed dramatically. And so has our ability to treat illnesses so is our ability to live longer. And so it is under this constant pressure that is borne by amazing people who work as doctors and nurses up in Derriford and work in the teams to try and manage that. 
Um, the truth is around around the finances is people will always argue for more money for the NHS. The truth is also that the NHS has never had more money. Okay. Um, but it's also true that more people are using it than ever before. Um, and that's what's really breaking the system the whole time is that um, use and uh, um, people turning up at A&E and so on is just higher than we've ever seen, um, particularly after the pandemic. And clearly then that has that knock on effect and, you know, it, the resource envelope gets stretched. And, you know, so I'm trying to build a new hospital up at Derriford where, you know, we've been successful in phase one of a, fa a five phase operation. We got £190 million last year to rebuild the emergency department. Uh, but that comes back to your previous points around like how daft politicians are, right? Because even when I did that, those people who get up every day and change my Wikipedia page, even they weren't happy then. They're, they're, there's still like stuff to criticise. You know, I'm literally trying to build a new hospital in Plymouth. Mm -hmm. But even then, they're trying to knock you at every stage. It will never happen, you know, willfully kind of mistranslating it to people and stuff. And you just, when I started, I found it quite difficult. So when I was just a, you know, well, I still am, but a normal lad coming into this, I was like, why are you trying to do my legs the whole time when I'm <laughs> like, there's nothing in this for me, right? I didn't get into politics for myself. I came in to serve the community, um, Plymouth and veterans. And I found it quite hard. But now I just realise that's just the way politics is really yeah i love it and i know i do this personally but i've got private health care right um and it feels like more and more certainly young people perhaps uh, are kind of going down the route where they're just paying for private health care now yeah a lot of my clients have recently yeah um what, what are your thoughts on that well i don't have private health cover um yeah i don't you know i want the nhs to work for everybody yeah there's huge challenges in this city um you know, dentistry is a really big one at the moment, to yeah, be honest it with is, you. Dentistry yeah. and GP appointments. You know, GPs, I've worked really hard on GPs. And to be honest, I haven't been as successful as I wanted to. Yeah. You know, we're about 21, 22 GPs down in Plymouth. Um, I've even got, you know, when Simon Stevens was head of the NHS, got him down and we ran a recruitment campaign specifically for Plymouth. Five million pounds he put into it. Specifically, we had, um, we had two applicants uh, and they both, they both dropped out before before they came to Plymouth. Recruiting GPs is really, really hard. And then that pressure, if you imagine that's your first point of contact with the health yeah. system, the knock on from that onto the front door of Derriford is obvious, right? And that's sometimes where it starts. I mean, dentistry is, we're in a similar place on dentistry at the moment. You know, there's 20, 24,000 people on the waiting list in, in um, for an NHS dentist. I'm one of them. Um, yeah, I'm the same. I, I, I got kicked out of my dentistry because I forgot to go to an appointment. And then just like, you know, life gets in the way. Now I thought, oh, I'll just go up for a checkup. And they were like, no, you've been, you've been removed. So I was oh, like, right. no, 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 I, like, I, didn't even, I didn't even miss an appointment. They just wrote me in the post. Yeah. It's like, it like getting binned by a girlfriend back in the day. Why is it such a problem? Lots of reasons. Uh, workforce planning. Yeah. So making sure there's enough dentists. Mm. Um, also the contract that was worked out you know, a long time ago now, 20 years ago, that uh, basically the contract that people work uh, and can, you know, complete that work in the NHS, they can obviously get paid more in private. And if people can afford that, you know, you re you'll struggle to find a dentist who's prepared to be worse off because he wants to treat NHS patients. There are people like that. But what we have to do is try and get the incentives right so that actually, you know, um, NHS dentistry is back on its feet. And that's what a group of us are trying to do in Plymouth at the moment. Yeah. And then in regard to, I guess, other pressures for the NHS, my, my other half's a doctor. So, so I hear about it from the inside a little bit as well yeah. as just looking from the outside. She's uh, she's a consultant, so she's not a junior, but obviously the juniors are striking quite a lot at the moment. Yeah, And it, it feels like what they're asking for is quite yeah. unrealistic. Yeah. Um, you know, and my other half being a doctor is very supportive of their right to strike and everything else, but yeah. is one of the people that are then in there trying to pick up the slack. So, I mean, um, I take a slightly different view. I was obviously in the military where you can't strike, the police That's can't right, strike. Yeah, yeah. I don't think I don't think these people should be striking. I think that is a different sort of job. Um, and I don't agree with them striking. Also don't agree with holding the government to ransom on a 35% pay increase. But is that what they want? 35%? Yeah, it's insane, mate. It's insane. <laughs> you know, we all make our beds, don't we? Um that's that's where they are. I think it's completely unrealistic, and I, I I fundamentally disagree with healthcare workers striking. I've worked incredibly hard to try and reduce wait times and improve performance at Derriford, and then another wave of strikes come along, and it just 
Yeah, smashes the whole thing. And I know there's people who've been delayed yeah. and have not had their care because people are out on strike. I'm afraid I just don't agree with it in healthcare. Mm. That will obviously upset a lot of people, but... Yeah, oh, I don't. Yeah, it's what it is, mate. You know, yeah. like I, I, mm. I just don't. Agree I completely with it. agree. To be perfectly honest, yeah, I, I don't really have much of an opinion. But when you say it like that, yeah, it puts people's lives in, at risk at the end yeah. of the day, and you do choose your your pathway, like you said. You do, no one's forcing anyone to be a doctor no. or a nurse. And but I just don't see how that how that gets resolved because, as you say, it's no, so we'll unrealistic. Get eventually, because they obviously do deserve a pay rise. Yeah, right. Because but they've had some good offers, though, right? Because well, there have been offers, but it hasn't been enough. And you know, we always go through this process, don't we, of government offering, and then slowly, slowly, and then we get there, right? But the only people I that just, suffer are the patients. Correct. Every time they're doing that, correct. People, that's the only people that are suffering. My dad is actually in hospital now, and he's waiting for a uh, emergency triple bypass. So he's he's just in a bed waiting and and those types of strikes might actually See, that, kill him that's, that's why I have a moral problem with um, healthcare workers strike yeah yeah I mean well Sam's another example isn't he our, uh, our jiu-jitsu coach recently it wasn't life-threatening but Sam is in Sam who runs the jiu-jitsu place with Mark uh, no. No, no 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 you're thinking of uh, Sham, Sam Sheriff yeah no, this is another chap. He's not a military guy. Um, so you may not have heard of him, but he was competing in London, um, got a leg locked, uh, spiral Rocks. fractured his tibia and his oh fibula. Oh, my God. That was on Sunday afternoon. He was still waiting at Kit. It was his in Kings in London, not down here, but was still waiting on Wednesday to have it surgically repaired. So three or four days, but it was the week of the strikes. Yeah. So he just, yeah, I think he just had a, in hospital, wasn't he? Yeah, <laughs> I think it was a day or so to get a bed and then he finally got a bed and then it, it got deprioritized several times because obviously there were more yeah. life-threatening surgeries that needed to be done. And again, that's just another example of, again, not life-threatening, but not pleasant for somebody to sit yeah, there for three the or four days. Waiting lists go up when they go on strike. Yeah, it's bonkers. And then another thing we mentioned as well is obviously men's mental health. Yeah. So you're obviously very much in that veteran space. And, yeah. you know, we've obviously had Mark on. We had uh, Ben Wadham as well, who's a local chap, ex, ex Royal Marine. He does a lot for men's mental health. He would use your um, hair stuff, actually. You know he's, what, yeah, he's you know? big into all that. Do you know, he yeah. didn't. He didn't. He didn't. I was surprised. He came really? in. He came on his bike. He had, yeah. he had helmet head. It looked like his hair had Did been he? cut with a spoon. But... Was he in his Speedos? He's always in his Speedos, isn't he? He wasn't on this occasion and he had his shirt on as well. Wow, that's quite it's rare. It's the first time I've seen him with a shirt yeah, on. Yeah, I know. Yeah. It's like <laughs> you don't recognise him, isn't it? Yeah. But yeah, it was a good episode and uh, it was, you know, he, he was very kind of uh, candid and, and emotionally quite vulnerable at points as well. You should check it out. It's, it's a good, good episode. Guy. But obviously, you know, those boys do a lot for men's mental health and, you know, outside of the military as well, it's a massive problem. It just seems across the board. I mean, what do you think is going on there? Obviously, you've got your view on, on, on veterans, but how about just normal population? I mean... Uh... I think there's lots of things coming together. I think, um, you know, our, our awareness of this is completely different um, now. I mean, I remember when I started, right, I, I you know, we went through a spate of uh, people um, coming off the Tamar Bridge, right? And I went down there and I couldn't believe there weren't basic things like a sign for the Samaritans and stuff. And I just wanted, like, my first ask was a sign for the Samaritans because you knew all sorts, right? You can put barriers up. Even getting a sign up for the Samaritans, it was like, we don't talk about suicide. We don't talk about people jumping off the Tamar Bridge because, what? you know, well, because because the thinking is that it then encourages copycat attacks. But for me, I, it just blew my mind. The reason I got involved was, you know, one of the worst things I saw was a, a lady jump off the Tamar Bridge. Um, you know, I was cycling, trying to get to her in time. And she just, you know, she had a little milk crate. She went over, hanging off. And, and then she fell off. And this poor guy was there trying to persuade his comrades. It's one of the worst things I've ever seen. You know, forget Afghan and all that. Uh, this was just so out of context in your day-to-day -day life. It was dreadful. So from that, I was like, you know, I really want to do some stuff around suicide off the Tamar Bridge. Um, but yeah, I found the authorities and, um, you know, and the people who run the bridge were really reticent to anything in this regard. And even getting that one Samaritan sign up down there was like pulling teeth. So even in in this in that time, you know, we do talk about it a bit more, and people are more honest and more open about it. That's obviously going to create a demand signal on healthcare services. There is more money in mental health um, than there has been before, but there is clearly still a significant unmet need, right? And I think we all have a a role to play in that, whether it's around mental fitness, whether it's the ability to be resilient and deal with day to day life. Um, you know, and at the same time, seek help early for those uh, conditions where you, you know, you can get treatment and, and you can get better. How do you feel about people like Ben who do a lot in the community through physical fitness to help their mental fitness? How come there's not enough, I don't know, provision to to help people 
jump into that more because a lot of the time I find we we once the problem's there we look to cure it but instead of curing it what about prevention what about getting people fitter healthier yeah, you're absolutely right well that's, that's and there's no you money know. ever going into that you know there's oh, oh, I'm a I'm a personal trainer yeah Paul is you know yeah. we we in the community we all feel the same but yeah. unless people have got a certain income they can only use me yeah you know because again our services are not the cheapest like is there any provision for people like us to yeah, help, so there is. I to mean, help I mean, regular people something called social prescribing has become a really big thing What's right that? where you can go to the doctors now and instead of prescribing you drugs or whatever you'll be prescribed a course in x y and z or even exercise or exercise classes um with um and with you know local groups and that happens a lot particularly amongst the elderly mm -hmm. uh in plymouth so i mean there are um there are aspects of that and a big part of obviously what ben does is is that is that sort of sustaining your mental health and you know to, to be honest that's why I, that's the only reason i exercise i don't you yeah. know i don't do the times or anything I, I i go running every day literally for my mental health um and you know and i encourage everyone everyone to do it i find you know it's the only real way i can stay in the job yeah it's just it's just always I don't know. There's so many people that I speak to who go, oh, I can't afford it. I can't afford to do this. I can't afford, not just the gym membership because that like, you know, you can go pure gym and it's 15 pound a month, you know, 99% yeah. of people can afford that, but it's understanding like how, how beneficial your health and fitness is to, to, to actually help your head. You know, like we, we do jujitsu and that's a massive yeah. thing for us to, yeah. to actually go out and fight and you feel so much better yeah. as a man and, all those different things, but so many, so many people miss out on that because they just, they, I don't think they realize the benefit. If you're not sporty, like us, so you, you were probably sporty as a kid and done all that sort of stuff. That's probably why you went into the military where there's, there's that big group of people who just probably never experienced sport. And then they, as they get into adulthood, they, they just struggle with it and they just don't understand. They don't have an outlet for it. Yeah, that's no, it's very true. Yeah. And I think another factor as well, people seem to lack a bit of purpose these days. Yeah. And maybe that comes back to, to lack of values as well. Yeah. And I don't know. I don't. I don't know how you fix that problem. How do you give people like an understanding of of their values and, and purpose? Well, that's why the military is such a great institution. Yeah, because yeah, it's one of those few sort of values driven. You know, it's all about character, particularly when you're away on operations. And you know, that's why you know Afghanistan was so sort of formative for so many of us. Because you know, when you are in close combat and things like that, there there is no rank really. There's no you know, there's no. It's it's literally all about character. And I've seen senior ranks completely crumple, and I've seen the quietest people just be completely resilient and be able to cope and deal with um, pretty extreme situations. So you know, um, uh, that that's that's why I'll always be a fan of the military. All the changes it goes through. You know, every military changes, but I still think it's the best thing you can do as a young person. It'll teach you obviously about other people but crucially about yourself and what you can and can't do yeah definitely do you think um we kind of lost something when we we ditched uh sort of a national service i was about to say that literally no, the same because, thing when he said because that because it's very different now right so it's, imagine the kids now doing like, national service yeah, yeah but the military is like super technical now right and it's not like you know grunting around um it's not you know it's not like that anymore and i'm not sure that you know, obviously there's countries that do it, right? But I'm just not sure that um, that's the real answer to some of um, the societal challenges at the moment. But, you know, never say never. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's something that we've, we've talked about before. It's, I think you think about a lot of the, the young generation, like we said, lack of purpose, yeah, lack of values, uh, lack of work ethic, arguably in some cases, lack of, you know, sort of appreciation for authority and, and respect and everything else. And I don't know, I feel like you gain a lot of those things, I imagine, because we've not been there, but for the military, you'd you'd get that. Yeah, I mean, the, the biggest thing I learned in the military is kind of about yourself. Mm. And obviously what you can do, but crucially, like what you can't do, because everyone thinks they can do anything, you know, and, and, and there's no kind of humility or um, ability to accept your limitations and all the rest of it and look after yourself and spend time and, you know, and, and really, really understand and search your character and figure out what you're made of. Yeah, 100%. So earlier you mentioned that we need to consider the values of our politicians yeah. in order to vote for them. So we're, we've got obviously an election coming up at some point um, in the future. Um, you touched on your values a couple of times, but yeah. tell us why, tell us about your values and tell us why people should vote for you in the next election. Oh, look, I, 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 I don't want... Um because otherwise they're just going to read the, read the wiki page, mate, and you're, you're uh, fucked. <laughs> <laughs> so we need something from you. <laughs> Look, I think, I think just, um, 
you know, I, I like I said, you know, I'm, I'm, I think it's pretty obvious to everyone now that I'm, you know, I'm not in this for myself. I try and look after people in Plymouth as best I can. I've completely transformed the way this country looks after her veterans, and you know, obviously, I'm very proud of that. But it's, um, it's not easy, you know. It's, it, it's, uh, it's um, the sort of job that really is a, a kind of calling and a service rather than anything else. Um, and uh, look, you should just go and go and look who's standing and look at the character and values of the individuals who are standing and, and find someone who represents you. I don't want to like give a, a big sort of party broadcast. <laughs> I just think uh, I um, you'll have people switching off in their droves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's why we asked at the very end of the podcast, mate. Just, uh, <laughs> just in case that happens. Good, in case that happens. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Good. Okay. Well, anything else you want to mention, mate? No, well, no, we, it's um, good. Good luck with the pod and uh, I look forward to seeing it. Yeah, brilliant. Appreciate you coming on, mate. Thank, Thank you. you. Cheers, buddy. Thank you.